psychologist. I'm the clinical director of the Sexual Offenders Assessment Board. Do you want to introduce yourselves? Or? Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Jonike David Kamar and I'm the executive assistant at the Sexual Offenders Assessment Board. Unfortunately, our executive director, Megan Dade, uh, couldn't attend today and she's very apologetic for that. And John? Do you want to introduce yourself? Or? I'm John Manning uh, with the SOAB Legal. So sorry about the passing the mic, but we're going to do the best we can here. Um, Today we're just going to talk about the Sexual Offenders Assessment Board, just to give you guys an overview of who we are and what it is that we do. Um, please feel free to chime in at any point or ask any questions, because we like question and answer better than just presenting. So ask away. Can you start it? Yes. Who we are and what we do. Um, we are. Our goal is to provide protection to the communities and citizens of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, especially our children. And we provide assistance to the prosecutors and the courts and other independent agencies such as OVA through our investigations and assessments of convicted sex offenders. We are comprised of a group of psychiatrists, psychologists, and other licensed professionals throughout the Commonwealth who are appointed by the governor for four year terms. And these are experts and in the assessment and treatment of sex offenders. They come from a wide array of backgrounds and have a wealth of knowledge in this field. Additionally, they are supported by Commonwealth staff, including myself and Stacy, along with our staff psychologist, whose main job is to read and review all of the assessments that we conduct in the SOAB, as well as investigators and administrative staff. We have offices here in Harrisburg, in Norristown, in Scranton, and out in Venango County. So we're our offices and our investigators are throughout the entire state of, of Pennsylvania. Why do, we, why do we even need the SOAB? Not all sex offenders are the same. We, each sex offender has a different background, different motivation, different levels of risk, which Stacey will discuss later. They have different risk factors, and there's different areas of need. We are tasked with different types of assessments. The first regarding our assessments are, we need to decide the risk and making sure that they have treatment and how to manage that risk. We help the parole board in deciding the risk of an offender if they were to be released into the community. Additionally, we provide risk assess, um, sorry, sexually violent predator assessments for court ordered uh, individuals who were convicted of sexually violent offenses, as well as Act 21, which John Manning will discuss later, which is our civil commitment of juvenile offenders. SOAB's main goal is to make sure the sex offenders are managed and their risks and needs are addressed through our assessments, both for the court and for the parole board. We conduct three main types of assessments. As discussed previously, we do our court-ordered sexually violent predator assessments. These are conducted prior to sentencing and, and after conviction. We also provide our parole board risk assessments. These are done prior to their parole minimum for the parole board. This will determine their risk of reoffending sexually in the community. We also provide Act 21 assessments, also known as sexually violent delinquent children. And this is assessments done on a limited subset of offenses for those who are adjudicated delinquent and are uh, sentenced to or committed to the SRTP program out in Torrance State Hospital. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, we're going to turn right now to the SVP assessment. What is it? Um, it's an assessment that is ordered by the court for any sexually violent offense, that's any kind of registrable offense, uh, under what's called subchapter H of the Sex Offender Registration Notification Act. It is conducted after conviction, but before sentencing, I think that's important to note. Uh, the SOAB has 90 days uh, from the from after, uh, after being ordered by the court, 90 days to do the assessment. Um, and the assessment is to do two things. It helps the court determine if the individual should be classified. 
classified as a sexually violent predator. And what is a sexually violent predator? It's defined by statute as an individual convicted of one or more sexually violent offenses and that has a mental abnormality or personality disorder that makes the person likely to engage in predatory sexually violent offenses uh, as far as that. Um, now the uh, assessment as well is also used as an aid in sentencing. It can be used by the sentencing court to make determinations on penalties as well, and that's been determined by the superior court to do that, that we can do that as well. Um, again, as we said, the, the, the uh, individual must have a mental abnormality or personality disorder. This is probably the biggest issue for making these determinations. Um, it is a legislative construct, these, these um, mental abnormality personality disorder uh, definitions. This mental abnormality definition, it provides that it's a congenital or acquired condition of a person that affects the emotional or volitional capacity of the person in a manner that predisposes that person to the commission of criminal sexual acts to a degree that makes the person a menace to health and safety of other persons. This definition actually came out of the 1995 Jacob Wetterling Act, which was the first federal, federal law for um, sex offender registration. Uh, so, in the personality disorder, we'll talk about that later, comes out of the DSM-5. Uh, but it is important to note that these definitions are, are legal in nature to some degree. Uh, the SOAB is not making a diagnosis when they do this. They are using diagnostic criteria. Uh, when they are making these determinations. And really, uh, the courts have said, the Superior Court has said that making that diagnostic determination is the most important part of this SVP determination. Without it, and without an expert to testify, you really cannot do an SVP determination. One thing we should note about these assessments, the assessments are not given to the court directly. The assessment is, is provided to the Commonwealth provided to either the district attorney's office or the attorney general's office who's ever prosecuting the case. And the Commonwealth has to precipitate the court, the sentencing court, for that hearing. And at that hearing, that's when the SOAB board member, uh, with their assessment, will be there to testify. Uh, defense attorney will usually also have a, 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 an expert to testify in kind of a, I would call battle of the experts type of hearing. Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our clinical director, St Dr. Stacy Janessa. Okay. Wait, did you? Why can't I tell if the microphone's on? <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about that? So basically, for the SVP assessments, we get ordered to do an assessment on anybody who is convicted of a sexually violent offense. And as most of you probably know, sexually violent offense is determined in statute doesn't have anything to do with like whether or not there's actual physical what we would see as violence. We do the assessment if the person is found to meet criteria for SVP there's a hearing and then the judge makes the final determination. If the person is not found to met criteria then I don't know I guess it gets filed away somewhere. <laughs> what we're looking for oh yeah. Uh, what does the assessment actually look like? What does that mean? So we have an investigator, we have numerous investigators. The investigator assigned to the case will go out and collect as much background information about the individual and the offense as possible. So in some cases they'll do an interview, but it's a person's constitutional right to refuse an interview, in which case we're able to proceed just on file alone. In some cases we have a ton of information, I mean like kindergarten records, school records, juvenile offense history, um, we generally always have a pretty thorough criminal history, in-state, out-of-state, history of offenses, DOC records, if there are prior DOC records, and so forth. The investigator will summarize this information in, um, in a report, and then that gets sent to our board member. The board member may interview the offender or may not, depending on whether the offender wants to participate and whether they need more information. And then they use the information that's been gathered to Several factors are reviewed in our assessments that I can go over if we have time, but there are facts of the offense, there are factors relevant to that offender, um, other factors that might contribute to lifetime risk. All of that information is put together to really answer the ultimate question of, 
is there a mental abnormality or personality disorder that predisposes this individual to predatory sex offending? So the, um, the investigator is like a police investigator or like a mental health professional? I don't, sort of in between, maybe a cross of both. John, can you can, yeah, but it's our investigators are come from a bunch of different backgrounds. We have some who are former law enforcement police officers. Um, we have some who have worked in children and youth. We have some investigators who are formerly um, with parole. But they kind of their interviews kind of combine fact gathering. Um, there's a there's a bug. There's a bug. Um, they get a lot of information on criminal history and so forth, but they also approach their investigations from this sort of mental health angle. So they get a lot of training either in the past or from us on mental abnormalities, paraphilias, um, personality disorders and so forth so that they can guide their questions in order to get the information that our board members need to make their determination. And our investigator and our investigators are Commonwealth employees. They're civil service, Commonwealth employees um, that are hired throughout the state. So they come, as state said, come from a wealth of knowledge. So that's the difference. It's our board members are appointed by the governor, psychiatrists, psychologists, licensed professionals, and then our investigators are Commonwealth civil service employees. So another question? Yes. So I understand it's the, uh, the offender's constitutional right not to talk to the SOAP uh, investigator, but without that interview, how are we sure that there's accuracy involved with all the data gathered, and to ensure that the you know the person indeed is an SVP or maybe indeed is not an SVP, how do we ensure that when there's no interview possible? Well, even when there is an interview possible, you can never really be sure that the information you're getting is accurate. There is a lot of research to show that sometimes interviewing can actually work to bias the evaluator in either direction. But the diagnosis that the diagnoses that we typically use to support mental abnormality, personality disorder, as you'll see, are generally things that can be supported with behavioral history. So you know, sometimes we have people who have like one offense, they don't have a long history. They come in in their interview, they talk about like how, well, I only committed this one offense, but I've been interested in kids for years. And let me tell you about all these things I didn't get caught for. And then we may find SVP, or had they not interviewed, we wouldn't. But I think you can never ensure accuracy. There are always gonna be um, things missed, but we just do what we can with all the information that's available to us. Yeah. So, wait, 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 wait. Oh, I forgot. so when you are, when your investigator is doing, doing their investigation, do they look at juvenile records and they look at, you know, um, mental health records, but if there is instance where that person was acquitted of a crime, are those incidents not looked at? Or so if records are expunged, if there's a case that's expunged, we generally have to act as if it didn't happen. If somebody's been acquitted of a case, um, we, will, we can consider the charges because it's part of their history and the weight that's put on it, the weight that it, the amount that it can be supported in an assessment or court will be determined by the board member who's doing the assessment. Yeah. <laughs> um, once an offender is given SVP status, does that go along with them for life or can that be removed in the future? So SVP status is for life. Um, <coughs> oh, John, John's going to take it away. No, I, I, I just want to clarify that uh, SVP uh, status is, is a lifetime registration requirement. I will say that um, recently, as part of Act 10 and Act 29 in 2018, there is a provision that allows after 25 years after either conviction or release from incarceration, an SVP, as well as Tier 3 sex offenders, can petition the court to be removed from mm -hmm. the website as far as that. Um, that was put in recently uh, in 2018, just to clarify that, but yes. Yeah, and we haven't seen, we haven't seen that many of those cases. I think we've only seen one of them so far. 
So, but I guess they should be popping up more in the future. So in terms of, um, oh, go ahead. Sorry, thank you. I just wondered what happens to uh, people who uh, were convicted prior to this SVP assessment were being formed? You know, if they, if they obviously didn't go through an assessment, so do they still get treatment? What happens if, you know, they weren't officially assessed? So if somebody was convicted of their sex offense and they don't, we don't, if someone was convicted of their sex offense before Megan's law, unless there's something that brings them back to us, we, I mean, we don't, they don't even come to our attention. Um, and do you wanna go No, to I, I, again, I, you know, this law has there's been, at least versions of it have been around since April of 1996. So if it's pre previous to that, yeah, you're, you're going to have that. But again, this was a law that was instituted back in '96. We have to follow the law and the and the and, the, and what the legislature says in doing those types of assessments. And these assessments, again, are for the court to determine SVP determinations. I should say one thing, and I think Stacy will get into it. These are not what's called actuarial assessments. When we're doing these SVP SVP assessments, they're not there to determine quote unquote risk. They're determined whether or not there is that mental abnormality or personality disorder that, that makes the person likely to uh, engage in sexually violent offenses. Right. So we're not looking at like, what are these person's chances of reoffending in five years or 10 years? We're looking at, is there something internal? Is there something in this person, in their makeup, in their personality that's predisposing them to offending? So. Generally, even though mental abnormality is a legal contract, we, our board members generally support mental abnormality with a diagnosis that comes from the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Psychiatric Disorders. Five, because it's the fifth edition, because I guess psychiatric disorders change over time. And as many of you know, there are a lot of different mental disorders, but not all of them. Most of them don't predispose people to sex offending. So like I'm prone to a little bit of anxiety, you know, my like heart is racing up here. So maybe I might meet criteria for a mental disorder in the DSM-5 generalized anxiety disorder, but that doesn't predispose people to sex offending. Generally, when we're looking at disorders that predispose to sex offending, we're looking at paraphilias and some in particular and personality disorders. And the ones that we most commonly see are pedophilia, which is like a deviant, long-standing sexual interest in young children, and antisocial personality disorder, which is just like a chronic disregard for rules and rights of others. And I'm going to go into these a bit more. Let me go to the next slide. So what is a paraphilic disorder? Basically, without reading this whole definition that's very long, a paraphilic disorder is like sexual interest in something that's like kind of weird. Um, some in something that's like not consenting, maybe that's not human, um, a part of a body uh, object that comes out of a body, usually in a bathroom. Those might all be paraphilias. And a paraphilia is the interest. A paraphilic disorder is when that interest starts causing some type of like impairment or distress. So everybody who comes to our attention will likely have the disorder because obviously they've gotten arrested and gotten in trouble. Pedophilic disorder is over a period of at least six months, a person has intense, recurrent, sexually arousing fantasies or urges of involving sexual activity with a prepubescent child or children. Generally, we're looking at age 13 or younger. Not that it isn't a disorder if somebody has an ongoing sexual interest and in behavior with 14 year olds, but that's something different that we can briefly talk about. The person has to have acted on these urges or the urges cause them a great deal of distress. And the individual has to be at least 16 years old and at least five years older than the victim or the object of interest. And the six months is not really like a magic number, but basically the DSM wants to make sure that we're looking at like a long-standing pattern of interest and not just something that's happened once or twice. So the threshold for establishing um, that somebody has a pedophilic disorder is fairly high. 
you need to see that this has been occurring over a period of time. Personality disorder, we all sort of know people with personality disorders, but it's like an enduring pattern of inner experience, a way of viewing the world of behavior that markedly deviates from the expectation of somebody's culture. Generally, personality disorders are pervasive and inflexible. You see them starting when a person is very young, and it's pretty stable over time and can lead to distress or impairment. Now, there are people with personality disorders, there are people who are histrionic, there are people who are dependent, but those generally, again, don't predispose to sex offenses. The ones that we see in our SVP assessments, it's generally antisocial personality disorder. Um, and again, antisocial personality disorder is a pervasive pattern of disregard for violation of the rights of society, the rights of others. And you have to have some of the following. So repeated arrests, failure to conform to social norms, um, irresponsibility, impulsivity, changing jobs, not paying your taxes, repeatedly getting into trouble, not learning from your mistakes, and so forth. Um, lack of remorse, those are all things that are seen in people with antisocial personality disorders. A lot of people who are incarcerated, who get in trouble, have antisocial personality characteristics, have engaged in antisocial behavior, but we're looking at like a lifelong pattern of behavior and relating to the world. In terms of making a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder, you need to look at, the person has to have evidence of <coughs> conduct problems when they were a child. The individual has to be at least, what, eight, 18, and you need to consider whether the antisocial behaviors are part of this person's personality or whether they're occurring only during like manic episodes or schizophrenic episodes or so forth. Because if they're like discrete, if this bug's gonna drive me nuts. If you have <laughs> discrete periods of antisocial behavior, but they only occur when somebody's having some type of like episode then they wouldn't get diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Okay, any questions? Okay. <laughs> Predatory is, again, a legally defined term. It is defined as an act directed at a stranger or a person with whom a relationship has been initiated, established, maintained, or promoted in whole or in part to support or facilitate victimization. So when we're looking at a sexually violent predator and we're looking at predatory behavior, we're not necessarily looking at somebody who's climbing in windows, jumping out of the bushes. This definition is pretty broad. So I will say that most of the offenses that we encounter, there is a predatory element. So even a parent who molests his or her own child, they're, once they're changing the nature of that relationship from like a caretaker to using that person, that child as a sexual object, that can fit this definition of predatory. Um, the cases where our board members don't often find predatory is when the offense involves looking at child sexual exploitation materials and they're only, and I don't mean only to minimize the offense, I mean they're viewing but they don't have a history of any type of like relationships or behavior. And those are situations where our board members often do not find the, credit, the predatory piece to be met. So something to note about our SVP assessments is we will often get calls from DAs or judges saying like, how did you not find this person to meet criteria? Sometimes an individual can commit a really like heinous offense and or can be high risk in terms of actual aerial risk assessment tools that we use, but they don't have this internal drive or we don't have evidence of it. They don't meet criteria. And we can have some people who can show up as low risk on assessment tools, and they may meet criteria. And the reason why is because we're not looking at five years, 10 years, we're looking at something in them that causes a lifetime, like a lifetime risk of reoffending, like the condition that drives the offending. And this is often a sticking point and is kind of confusing, so please feel free to ask away. Nothing? Okay. Were you going to talk about registration requirements? Or? 
Okay, so registration requirements are generally based on, oh yeah, go ahead. Real quick question. Um, so what, do you, what does an investigator, what kind of a, I'm sorry, but I had a big mouth. You do, you're loud, you're good. insufficient information to then our board member will write up an assessment and say the we'll have we'll have the efforts to obtain information documented and then we'll just say that there's insufficient information to determine you know to say that this person meets criteria and um, you know our goal is not to find somebody to be an SVP it's to determine whether they meet criteria so if there's insufficient information we, you know, we can just do the best we can. Thank you. Go ahead. Can an SVP assessment be requested after the fact, even during incarceration? We do a separate type of assessment that's done during incarceration. Those are for parole board. The SVP assessment is done um, within the 90 days in between um, conviction and sentencing. So it's requested around the time of conviction. So not during actual incarceration? During incarceration, and I guess we can go ahead and just look at these. So when somebody's incarcerated for a sexually violent offense, they, and they're eligible for parole, they get referred to the parole board. They get referred to us for an assessment that gets used by the parole board. And it gets used to help the parole board make decisions regarding whether they're gonna parole someone. These assessments also get used by supervisors in terms of managing the offenders and by their treatment providers in the community in terms of like what their treatment risk and needs are. So in those assessments, we often have a lot more information and most people participate because they're, you know, there's incentive, they wanna get paroled. And in those assessments, we do a more traditional risk assessment. So we'll look at actuarial tools, um, the static 99R, is there anybody in here who's heard of the static 99R? Okay. So the static 99R is an actuarial risk assessment tool it looks at groups of incarcerated sex offenders and it says like if these criteria are in place this is the percentage of people who are charged or convicted with a new sex offense over the next five or ten years we also look at dynamic risk factors like what are some factors that contribute to this in this individual's risk of reoffending sexually and um, you know what can be done to manage those in the community so it's not an SVP determination, but it's used to make parole decisions and community management decisions. Okay, so in terms of registration, um, we have different tiers of registration that you're gonna hear about um, as the state continues, but for SVPs, everybody, anyone who's determined to be an SVP, and again, that determination is made by the judge. We just defend our position on it. Um, they are required to register like their lifetime registrants no matter what the offense is um, there is active community notification by law enforcement so instead of just being on the Megan's Law website the police will go like door to door and be like you know hey mr. Smith just moved into your neighborhood um, I don't know don't invite him to your pool <laughs> so and then there's also passive community notification. They are listed as an SVP on the Megan's All website. Can, the, can I just add a couple things here? Yeah. 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 Can I just, let me just, and then the one thing that really makes this kind of special is that our, um, that SVPs are mandated into lifetime treatment with a treatment provider who's approved by the, by the SOAB. So they have to attend treatment for the rest of their life with the idea that these conditions are manageable and if they continue going to treatment, hopefully they can manage their condition over the course of their lifetime. Oh, I'll stay over here. I don't, I don't want the fly to get me. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to say as far as the treatment, the board, one of the board's statutory duties is to monitor compliance. Uh, again, Stacy talked about active and passive notification. Uh, that's in subchapter I of, of SORNA that talks about that. Uh, active is that written notification that's given to neighbors, uh, superintendents of schools, uh, uh, daycare centers, uh, as well as presidents of colleges, 
uh, that has to go out. Uh, and then the passive notification, and this, these were terms that were actually used way back in 2004 as well, uh, when Megazone 3 came out, is more that sex offender registration website that goes up. One thing I, I want to note here that's not on, the, uh, on here is that there's also victim notification. Uh, victim notification is within 72 hours of registration of the individual, training of address of the individual that has to be provided uh, by the uh, uh, by either the municipality or the state police, although I, the victim advocate, I believe, uh, through a memorandum of understanding, does that now and has been doing that for probably almost a decade, correct, uh, as well. Um, so that's the only thing I wanted to say as well. And, and again, we do have, uh, it is assessing, it is lifetime registration, uh, but as far as since 2018, there has now a, a uh, opportunity to get off of that uh, registration, uh, but you have to have a hearing, and the SOAB has to do an assessment to determine that, that they are no longer likely to commit predatory sexual violent offense. It's kind of the inverse. We haven't seen that yet. Uh, I think the reason that the court, the, um, the legislature put that in, there was a Supreme Court case called Collin v. Lee, that where the court kind of um, criticized not having a way to get off the registry uh, and looking at the constitutionality of these laws. So that was put in kind of to, as a safe play, safe way to, to keep the constitutionality of these of the, this statute. Yeah. Okay, so our parole board assessments, as I said, they're assessments of offenders who are being considered for parole. We provide the parole board with independent expert opinions on this person's risk of reoffending sexually when he or she is returned to the community. Our assessments, these assessments are great. If any of you have ever seen them, they have so much information. They're so detailed. They are, they're really, they really capture the offender and oftentimes they have information from so many different places um, it's just a really really good comprehensive view of this individual who's being considered for parole we also focus on issues related to treatment and management needs of the offender so that the, the assessments can also be used by um, by parole and by treatment providers So again, we're looking at static risk, dynamic risk, and community needs. And basically, in terms of the treatment needs, we are looking at what are these individuals' treatment needs in the community. Our board members will focus on issues related to sex offender-specific treatment, so empathy, arousal management, if that's relevant, um, tools for like relapse prevention, things that are very sex offender-specific. However, sex offending doesn't occur in a vacuum, and so our board members will also make recommendations about general mental health needs, substance abuse treatment, batterers treatment, whatever other treatment needs this individual is assessed to need in order to help him live like a productive, non-offending life. In terms of management needs, we can look at things like housing, education, make recommendations regarding types of employment that a person maybe should or oftentimes shouldn't have, um, social and recreational needs, and then sometimes there are just concerns that are specific to the individual being assessed. And basically we're looking at like what has to be done to build up both the internal and external mechanisms of this individual to reduce risk of reoffending. Um, should we talk about risk assessment tools? Oh, we do? Okay. Okay. So I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about some of the risk assessment tools we use. The Static 99R was developed in Canada. It is, it looks at risk of reoffending sexually. It's an actuarial, so it's like the weather, it's like predicting weather or like car insurance and so forth, it looks at certain criteria and then gives an estimate of risk. And generally this is for like groups of individuals over a short period of time. But it's really been the gold standard in risk assessment of sex offenders. And um, it's more accurate than just relying on clinical judgment alone. We are very, very bad at determining who is likely to reoffend. 
We also use the hair psychopathy checklist. Basically, um, higher scores on this instrument can be correlated with risk of reoffending in a violent manner. Um, it's a good indicator, this tool, of somebody's level of psychopathy. Um, and generally, people with higher psychopathy scores tend to do poorly when they're released into the community, when they're put into treatment, even though oftentimes they will appear to be doing really, really well. The items on the Static 99 are, when you look at the instrument, it looks very, very easy to score. It's actually incredibly complicated, but we're looking at the age of the offender at the time that he, or, that he is released. You can't use this on females. From prison, if the person has ever lived with a partner, if there is a conviction for non-sexual violence in the offense, in the index offense, the offense that, you're, that they're incarcerated for, if you have any prior convictions for violence, if there's a history of charges or convictions for sexual offenses, unrelated versus a related victim, people with unrelated victims tend to reoffend at higher rates. People with um, stranger victims tend to reoffend at higher rates. People with male victims tend to have higher rates of reoffending. And again, reoffending doesn't mean reoffending. It means being charged or convicted of another sex offense. Then we look at, yeah. What is their gender non-binary? So they're, in terms of the victim or the offender? So in terms of the offender, the Static 99 R manual lays out, they talk about like transgendered offenders, but they haven't captured um, sort of the entire, like the range. And I believe it can be used on somebody who identified as male, like you look at the gender at the time of the offense. But I'm not sure, I don't think that the instrument, um, there, I think there's a new scoring manual coming up, but I don't think that it accounts for the, you know, for gender non-binary for, um, for every situation. I think it's a pretty binary tool. And we have assessed some um, non-binary individuals, some transgendered individuals, but that is not um, a group that we have see, that we see that often. We're mostly dealing with like identify as males. Okay, that's a good question. In terms of stable dynamic risk factors, um, we're looking at things in this person's environment that predispose them that might predispose them to offending, and that they can work on in treatment, or that they can work on in terms of like being managed in the community. So, is this a person with social supports? Um, are they, do they have hostility towards women? Do they identify with children? And so forth. And these are things that can be changed over, that can be changed over time and are often good treatment targets. Is a person who's sexually preoccupied who has trouble with sexual self-regulation. We also look at acute dynamic risk factors. These are things that would impact like immediate risk. So if a person suddenly presents as more hostile or more sexually preoccupied, that would be something that their supervisor or their treatment provider could look out for. Okay, and then we just make some determinations about risk and recommendations and everybody can use them as they see fit. Our next type of assessments are Act 21 and I'm gonna turn it over to John. All right, I'm, I'm going to risk it to see, make sure the fly doesn't come at me <laughs> this time. Uh, I want to make sure. Uh, so we have Act 21 assessments. Act 21 was enacted in um, August 14, 2003. Um, and it's really what is a, a, a involuntary civil commitment law. Um, and it's for individuals who are found to be uh, uh, who committed what's called acts of sexual violence. How this really started was there was an incident in Lebanon County uh, where there was an individual in, in a youth development center um, who had, they had found his diary and they saw that he had all these things.
things that he was going to do once he got aged out of the system, he got out of the system. It was right at that 20-year-old, 20, 20 21st birthday. Uh, and so in, in response to this, uh, legislation was passed in 2003 so that there would be some civil commitment uh, of these individuals before they aged out of the system. So what you have here is, uh, is that the individual, how it works is uh, if the individual has been um, adjudicated delinquent of, of one of these, um, uh, what they call acts of sexual violence, such as rape, IDSI, aggravated indecent assault, indecent assault, um, as far as one of those uh, uh, sexual assaults, one of those, uh, th those uh, crimes. Uh, again, they're not crimes, they've been found delinquent of them. Uh, and they are in an institution uh, on their uh, 90 days prior to their 20th birthday, uh, then there will be referral from the juvenile probation officer under the statute to the SOAB to do an assessment of this individual. Um, the institutions usually like the Youth Development Center, um, uh, Juvenile Delinquent Center, and if they're in there 90 days prior to their 20th birthday, then the juvenile probation officer will send uh, information, also provide copies of information and records to the SOAB uh, so that they can provide an assessment. Um, now, the one thing that's been very frustrating, I guess, a lot for SOAB has been uh, getting some documents that are uh, psychotherapist patient privilege. Obviously, we understand there's a psychotherapist patient privilege, uh, but a lot of this information that's shared in the court, the SOAB does not get that, and there have been actual uh, period court cases in the TV that says we're not going to get that information if it's treatment information, but we are supposed to get the other information uh, from the juvenile probation department. Um, the SOAB has uh, 90 days, uh, it's 90 days after the 20th birthday to provide the assessment to the court. After the court gets the assessment, then the court can have what's called a disposi dispositional review hearing uh, at that point uh, to determine whether or not there's a prima facie case that the individual uh, has a mental abnormality, personality disorder that makes them, uh, that makes it uh, likely that they have serious difficulty controlling their sexually violent behavior. Uh, this standard really comes from uh, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court case, Kansas v. Hendricks, which said as far as adult civil commitment, the, the statutory state, the constitutional standard to do that type of assessment, uh, and that you could have that clear and convincing evidence standard to do those assessments um, as far as that. So after the disposition review hearing, if there's a prima facie case, the court can order the county solicitor, solicitor or designee uh, to uh, petition the court for a hearing. Uh, and at that hearing, that is when the court makes a final determination whether or not to civilly commit the individual. If the court decides to civilly commit the individual, they can be committed for up to one year as far as that. And with, if they are committed, then they are committed to the um, uh, Juvenile Civil Commitment Program, which is a, called the Sexual, Re Sexual Responsibility and Treatment Program, the SIPP. That is located at the Ford State Hospital. It is, it is uh, part of the Department of Human Services. Again, when this commitment is done, they're committed to a hospital. Uh, it, it is a, a state hospital. It's not a prison. Uh, again, they cannot leave, but it is a hospital. This is a secure facility, and residents should not permit to leave the grounds of the facility without court approval. Um, after the one year, uh, in fact, it's 60 days prior to the one year uh, expiration of the, um, uh, of the uh, commitment date, the SOAB and the SRTP both have to provide reports to the court uh, at that annual review to see whether or not they still have trouble uh, controlling their sexual violence. Sexually violent behavior at that point. Um, the court can either uh, decide to uh, recommit them for another year or they can uh, transfer them to the outpatient program. Uh, the SOAB at the Department of Human Services has to come up with a treatment plan in order to do that. Uh, at that time, if the, an outpatient treatment plan is made, uh, the individual can be uh, uh, transferred to the outpatient program. That's going to be for um, uh, 
where, where the individual would be subject to uh, uh, polygraph examinations. They'll also be uh, subject to residency restrictions, location restrictions as well. Um, and um, they also have the treatment provider will have to provide 30 day uh, reports to the court to state what is happening with this, what's called sexually violent delinquent child. Um, if at any time the SVDC violates any of the court's rules, they're brought back immediately to the inpatient treatment program, okay? Um, if they successfully complete the outpatient treatment program, they can be discharged um, either after a petition by the SRTP that they no longer have trouble uh, with their sexually violent delinquent behavior or uh, after the one year commitment uh, hearing that they have each year and uh, the court determines that as well uh, as far as that. So once they're an inpatient, um, they, they can't, they don't, they just don't get immediately released. They have to do at least one year outpatient uh, treatment as far as it, and then after that, then they could possibly be released. Even if they are released, they are still subject to monthly counseling that has to be uh, paid for by the uh, SVDC or it can be paid by the SOAB if the SVDC cannot pay for it. And that is for the rest of the SVTC's life. Okay. Any questions about Act 21 of 2003? All right, uh, way in the back, pink shirt. Is there a, oh, oh, I'm sorry. He said pink shirt. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's no, that's, that's okay. No problem. Do you, do you have stats? Oh, I'm sorry. Normally when I'm pulling my phone, I'm in just different conditions. So I'll try to do that. Do you have a stats on, uh, like, how many people have actually been discharged from this program? And then Discharge totally. We had toured it a couple of years ago and the numbers were very really low at that point, so I was just wondering if uh, outcomes have uh, improved or if there's been more successful discharges. So um, I'll just give you the wide array of stats as broad generally, I don't have the specifics, but currently we've only been uh, referred to about 500 cases since. 2003, so it hasn't been a large number. And currently, there's only about 70 people in the program right now. Um, a lot of people think when we say juvenile civil commitment, that means a wide, large number of individuals. It is a very small program, given that it's been in existence for nearly 20 years. I believe the amount of discharges have been less than seven or eight. Um, so. It is, again, a small number due to also, there's only about 70 people in the program. I can give you the specific numbers um, later today or tomorrow if you need them. And just to follow up, are they all males that are there? Yes, it most, it's only been males that have been in the program. You know, I mean, I don't really have all that much to add except that the program has been really working on um, trying to evaluate what they need to do to move the individuals forward. A lot of the individuals who come to the program, besides having committed some pretty horrible offenses, come from background, like some really incredibly traumatic backgrounds and come in with a lot of difficulties and they're very institutionalized because many of them have been in various institu institutions since they were like very young, you know, childhood, early teens. So it's a challenging population. Okay, wait, there are some other I think questions. I well, Greg, yes? Yes, thank you. Is there any notification um, when it comes to the Act 21 of juveniles coming back into the community as far as community notification, victim notification, and can a juvenile be moved actually into a sexual violence predator? So I don't know the answer to community notification when the SVDCs get moved into the community. John can speak to that, but since I have the mic, I'll answer the rest of your questions. Um, if they commit, if they get released, so first, at the time that they're committed to SRTP, they're no longer juvenile. So sexually violent, delinquent child is kind of, makes it sound like we're civilly committing children, but they're not, they're adults. Like a lot of, some of the men there have like receding hairlines. Um, 
but if they commit a sex offense after they're released, then they would go through the same process of being evaluated for SVP. Do you want to speak to this? Yeah, the SVPC is, is for if the individual has been adjudicated delinquent. So with regard to SVP, they would only be declared an SVP if they've actually committed a crime and been convicted in the adult system. Uh, that would be that would, would be what would trigger that type of thing. Uh, it, it, I don't look at the, the, the law every day on the SVPC and uh, notification because really there have they have not had anyone. Uh, I can't think of released or as far as that. Uh, Someone was just released just a few months ago, couple months. but I can't remember. It's very uh, small amount get get released. Um, my understanding, and I know we're going to have somebody from the Attorney General's office speak on this as well, uh, that it's very similar to uh, to uh, what SVP notification is as well. Any other questions? Because that way when we do the recording, everyone can hear what's being said. All right? 
Thank you.